So good evening. Tonight we are going to jump into some generic scan tool diagnostics. Um, we're going to be using, uh, for my examples, we'll be using one of our inexpensive OBD2 interfaces uh, like the Vicar or the VPeak. It's an it's a ELM327 interface. Um, and uh, we'll use that as an example to teach you diagnostic strategies. And before I jump into this presentation, let me just switch my screen share really quickly uh, to our Canvas page. So here we are, here we're on, uh, on Canvas. Um, I have gone through and I've updated uh, grades. So that's up to date now. Um, again, thank you guys for being here. I have not put in your bonus points for uh, attending live. Um, but uh, we'll get you guys. Uh, uh, we'll get you guys some points because I really appreciate you being here. Um, this whole program just works better, quite frankly, uh, when uh, when you're here uh, with me live. So that if you have a question, you can ask it, and I can make sure that I make it uh, work well um, for you guys. All right. So I'm just doing a little. Screen capture. All right, we'll get that done. So a couple more housekeeping things. There we go. All right. So um, as far as what's coming up and what to do, let me put my Canvas page. Let me put my Canvas page in my student mode so you can see the pink border on there. And uh, when you're in student, you know, when, when you're on Canvas, you have this to-do list on the side, so that's a great way to great way to keep track of what am I supposed to do here. So you have that. The other thing I would encourage you to do is take a look at your calendar over there. In fact, I'll clear out these drawings and I will do just that. I'm going to turn on the calendar so we can see what's due. Now I have adjusted a few due dates. And I'm, I'm constantly, you know, kind of fine tuning things. So I'm constantly trying to uh, fine tune things for you guys for your benefit in that I normally like to talk about stuff before it's due. And so a, a few of you guys have done some of the assignments coming up and I think that's fantastic. But I will make sure that tonight before the end of class that I talk about these assignments right here. Um, uh, in fact, since I got them circled, okay, let's, let's just jump into them. So this first one here says, hey, what is your protocol? What it allows you to do uh, with our little scanner app is figure out our protocols, usually pretty easily. Um, it will tell you right here in, the, in this area of the screen, what's the communication protocol? Now, let me back up for a minute. What is communication protocols? Think of it as the computer language that's happening between the scan tool, right? For us, our interface. So between the scan tool interface and the vehicle. Um, and that's important to know uh, if you ever have a communication problem. Now, my tech tip a couple weeks ago was, hey, if you have a scanner that won't communicate, uh, first things first, try another scanner. Um, but if, if you go beyond that and another scanner won't communicate, it, it's very likely either a protocol pro problem or a pin fit, fit issue. So I want you to, to be aware of what these communication protocols are. So here's that list. Now, what I did on this particular vehicle, it was an older one. and I had to go through and manually try different protocols until I found one that communicated. Um, so if you go under the settings, and uh, you click this little icon right there. I'll change that color. If you click this, you can go under your settings and go to communications and, and figure that stuff out if the protocol doesn't automatically come up right there. Let's look at some of the other assignments coming up. All these things really by themselves, they're pretty quick, pretty easy. Remember, this is only a one unit class. I'm not trying to kill you guys but I am trying to get you to learn some stuff about scanners. So everything that I've put together here for you just to do just that. 
This one's probably in some ways a little bit more difficult. It doesn't really require you to scan a car, but it does require you to look up some information. Um, so if I look at this little scanner screen right here, what you'll see is, boy, there's, there's all kinds of different data pigs from engine RPM to the coolant temp to things like long-term and short-term fuel trim. And then the question becomes, well, okay, this is what it looks like here on my scanner. This is the data, or actually those are the units. This is the data I'm getting here. Is that good data or not, right? So the idea with this activity is to get you to just pick one scanner pit, one parameter, and research about it. Use your CDX book, you could use Google, you could, you know, but research one PID. So what if I, you know, imagine I took your um, uh, short-term fuel trim. Well, look up, what is short-term fuel trim? What is it supposed to be? Is 0% a good reading? And kind of go through there and learn that thing and you're gonna share it in a discussion. And I have, I, ha I say, hey, try, just talk about it at cold startup, at hot idle, under normal driving conditions to kind of give folks different, um, what should it look like under different operating modes? And I even give you an example. So I took the engine coolant temperature sensor or ECT sensor and answered those same questions as far as voltage and ranging and different temperatures of the engine. So, um, so that, that one's probably causes you to do a little bit more research. If each person in our class posts one, um, one uh, uh, data pit and talks about it, you'll end up with a good amount of data pits that are covered, that, a good list that you can look at to learn what those pits are supposed to be. And then last but not least, we have our first quiz coming up, which is about OBD2 and codes. In fact, we're gonna look at some codes tonight. So with that, let me change my screen share again. And we're gonna jump into this diagnostic. So here we are. I need to back up the slide here and we'll make this thing even a little bit cleaner, hopefully for you. There it is. And I'm just checking our uh, uh, checking on the chat. Okay. Yeah, G, I got your message. Bring um, bring your blue driver app thing. Bring it to class tomorrow. I want to check it out. Um, and keep that in mind for everybody. There are some questions about seeing, hey, what's my protocol? Um, if you're running by the school at all, feel free. You can. I have a set of these and these. You could always check one out from the school, take it home and play around with it. So you could compare that to whatever you have. Now, I accept any, you know, any OBE2 compatible scanner. That, you know, that'll work for you. I'm going to use the scanner app pro as far as far as our demonstrations. Okay. Um, all right. So moving, moving right along. Generic scan tool diagnosis. First of all, I want to say when you look at things and I know some of you guys are in the multimeter class, you're in the multimeter class and your um, and you're in the scan tool class, and these two 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 tools work really really well together. Um, what I will say is that the scanner, and this this actually comes from from Snap on. This is kind of their terminology. They talk about how the scanner is the backdoor information. Why is it backdoor? it's processed calculated data. Where something that you're measuring with your meter, that's the front door because you're measuring the signals raw, right? Maybe you're testing something like an oxygen sensor. You're testing that sensor directly. Um, so that's front door. Once you're scanning it, whatever this sensor was making as far as a voltage signal, that has been processed by the computer turned into a bunch of ones and zeros and fed through the data stream, you know, no matter what protocol it is, whether it's J1850, CAN, ISO 9141, 
it's sent with ones and zeros to your scanner. And so there's always the, the possibility that some of that stuff gets misrepresented or misinterpreted by your scanner. Um, so you need both tools. The scanner usually gets you close. The meter is how you pinpoint your exact problem most of the time. So front door versus back door. Now let's talk about our scanners real quick. The scanner interface that we are using is, you know, it's not really like a professional one. It's more of a do-it-yourselfer one, um, but it's a good backup. It's a good, like I have my own professional thousand dollar plus scan tools, but this is a good backup. It will, uh, if that tool doesn't communicate or I'm going on a road trip or like, this is a good tool to keep in your car. And if I want just a fast code check or a fast check of my monitors to make sure I'm ready for an emissions inspection, this tool works really well and it's pretty darn fast. And so it's a good generic scan tool. And so when I look at all these um, tools I have here on the screen, these are all different cell phone app interfaces, but they're all generic scan tools, which means that they should communicate with any 1996 and newer vehicle, but I'm going to be limited on what data I can do. And basically, I'm limited to the stuff that the government mandated the car manufacturers give us. Let's compare this to a manufacturer specific scan tool. A man specific or manufacturer specific scan tool, like this Toyota Textream right here, well, first of all, that thing cost $8,500 when it first came out, okay? Secondly, every year you have to spend, I don't know, 1200 bucks or so to renew your subscription with Toyota to keep it working. Now, this tool can do everything. It can do programming. It can do, um, if you're a registered locksmith, it, it can do the keys and stuff. I mean, it can do all kinds of stuff, um, but it's really expensive. Um, and this particular one here is only for Toyotas um, and Lexus vehicles. It would not work on a Chevy or a Ford really. So the advantage of our generic scanner is that, you know, you're only gonna access P0 codes, but guess what? It's also not going to lie to you. One of the, the requirements of OBD2, and think of the OBD2 side, Almost think of this as, yeah, two separate scan tools, but think of this as two separate sides of the computer that's in your car, right? If you have a 1996 or newer computer in your car, you have one side of the programming that is the manufacturer side. The other side of the programming is the mandated government OBD2 side. And one of their stipulations is that it cannot lie to you. The data cannot be false. Yes, you're only gonna get P0 codes, and, uh, you know, you're not going to have the same bi-directional controls. I mean, you, you're, you're, you're scratching the surface of that data. However, there's still a lot of diagnosis that I can do with this. And as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, remember that OBD2 is largely focused on emissions. In fact, it has a whole host of what we call monitors. And the majority of those monitors are emissions related monitors. So, so there's a catalyst monitor, an EGR monitor, an EVAP monitor. Because remember the goal of OBD2 is to try to make sure the vehicle's emissions are low over the life of the vehicle. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, what about OBD1 cars? Because there is a question on the chat about OBD1. OBD1 is hit or miss, and you're generally speaking going to have to have a professional tool or a semi-professional tool to access OBD1 information, okay? So for something like that, you would have to come to the school, maybe on a Friday during my skill and speed class, we can hook up the scanner, figure out the right adapter for your OBD1 car, your older vehicle, and scan it. You're usually on OBD1, you're going to be limited to just codes and some data, okay? Now, if you have a GM vehicle, those had a little bit more powerful computer system. In fact, like I said two weeks ago, the GM OBD1 system played a big role in what became the OBD2 standards. 
Um, so GMs could do bi-directional controls. They can do some other stuff. But again, they're not going to have monitors and, and things of that nature. Um, but I would certainly enjoy for you to come to the school and play around with an OBD1 car if you have one, because uh, that's, that's a whole lesson in itself. All right. Um, so let's move forward. So uh, first of all, we talked about how in OBD2, there was alphanumeric codes. We said, hey, you have these codes. Maybe I have um, uh, a P, P, let's see, P0171. That's a lean fuel trim code for bank one. That P0171 will mean the same thing whether I'm standing a Chevy or a Ford or a, um, a Toyota or, or whatever, okay? Here I, um, I'm, I've scanned some codes on this little scanner, and this is kind of what you get from your local auto parts store. So it's not necessarily a professional scanner. It's, it's kind of more like a, a do-it-yourselfer or maybe a semi-professional tool. Um, we're getting a P0420, right? P0420, catalyst, low efficiency, bank one. That's going to mean the same thing on a Chevy or a Ford or whatever. And then again, I have a P0301, that's a misfire for cylinder number one, and it's generic, so it would be the same on any car that I measure a P, or I record a P0301, it means I got a misfire in cylinder one. Now, we got that out of the way. And of course, the P stands for powertrain. The zero here, next digit, tells us it's a generic code the next three digits kind of isolate exactly what that code is, what the system is, and then what the actual problem is. All right, well, what about setting that code? And this is really, really important. What about setting that code? What do I got to do to turn on the check engine light? Or Amber, the new name for this, the proper OBD2 name is the MIL for malfunction indicator lamp. What do I got to do to turn on the mill? Well, depends on the code. There's two times, types of codes in OBD2 programming. There's type A codes and type B codes. Type A codes set on their first trip. The first time they see a problem, uh-oh, boom, turn on the light, set a code. A type B code is a little different. Type B, what happens is it sees the problem, it goes, uh-oh, something's wrong. I'm gonna set a code, but it does not turn on the check engine light right away. It waits for that problem to happen again and for it to see that same failure two times in a row. And then it's gonna be, okay, I definitely have a problem. Now, now I'm gonna turn on the check engine light and let the vehicle owner driver know that something's wrong. Why did they do this? Well, back in the days of OBD1, you had cars where the check engine light was on and then you drive a little bit, it was off. We have a car right now in, in our family that's OBD1 and it doesn't have the check engine light on at idle, but if you rev it up a little bit, a lot of times the light will come on. You let it idle back off, the light idle back down, the light comes off. So people got used to the check engine light turning on and turning off. And they probably looked at the underneath their hood and they're like, well, the engine's there. And they just started ignoring that light. So what we tried to do with OBD2, what the what the, the engineers and government tried to do is only turn on the light when there's a real problem. And uh, hopefully the customer will, will give it a greater sense of importance. And so that's what we call, you know, kind of better mill functionality is that a lot of codes, in fact, the vast majority of codes or what we call a type B code, they're gonna have to see two failures in a row before they turn on the check engine light. So the computer needs to be extra sure that we really have a problem before that computer turns on the mill. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about enable criteria. Remember that's the, and I'll type it out, conditions. conditions necessary to get the computer to test itself out, to run a monitor. 
So if you drive a car around in such a way that you never meet the enable criteria, it might not test that particular component for months. So let's use this cat monitor as an example. Now, generally speaking, to run the catalyst monitor, what the computer is going to want to see is the cars going down the road at a steady throttle, usually somewhere between, let's say, 50 and maybe 65 miles per hour. Okay, that car's cruising on the road, steady throttle. I'm not goosing it. I'm not slowing down. I'm steady throttle so it can test out that cat. So if you're the type of driver that you're either like wide open throttle or you're slamming on the brakes and then you're back to wide open throttle, if that's how you drive, it might be forever before you meet the enable criteria to run the catalyst monitor. So let's say, for instance, I had a problem with my cat and it really was messed up. Its efficiency was low. It would have to test the cat and that's usually going to be a type B because it's got to test it two times in a row. So maybe it tests it one time and it fails its test. It sets a code. But, you know, the way I drive, always on the throttle, always on the brake, it takes me two months before I drive it like a sane person and have a smooth, steady throttle that's smooth enough for it to test that cat again and then finally turn on the light. Okay. So how you drive the car can really affect things because remember, you're trying to meet enable criteria. Okay, so now you know about type A and type B codes. Most codes these days are type Bs and they require two trips. An example of a type A code would be a misfire code, a fuel trim code. Oftentimes those, if you're gonna get a type A code, it's gonna be misfire or fuel trim. All right. Um, so speaking of codes, something that came about with OBD2, which was a huge step forward, is that when I set a code, like here I got this catalyst or this misfire code, when I set a code, I'm gonna set, I'm gonna set a freeze frame. So if I look at this scanner screen over here, Here's my scanner screen, and it kind of looks like this cell phone app, doesn't it? I have a P0301 cylinder one misfire. That's my code. This is the freeze frame data. This is how the car was being driven when I set the code. So I can see that was my long-term fuel trim, my short-term fuel trim. Ooh, he was having to add a lot of fuel there. That's interesting. We were in closed loop. Uh, this was at 27 kilometers an hour. So what's that? 15, 20 miles an hour, 3000 RPM, 65 degrees C is a fairly warmed up engine, 82% load. What this allows me to do is drive the car around the same way and reduplicate that problem. Okay. In fact, I will try to save my freeze frame data, take a screenshot of it just like this. So that when I'm done with my repairs, I can drive the car in the same way to make sure that those repairs really did fix the car. Now I have a little note that I put on here. Don't forget to check pending codes. What's that? Well, remember type A, type B codes, a type B code. So I'll put a B right here. He sees the problem and goes, uh-oh, but he's got to see it fail again before he turns on the check engine light. So if I have a code that's been set, but it hasn't triggered through a second failure to turn on the check engine light, that's what we call a pending code. So on this vehicle, and this is actually the little vehicle simulator on off of CDX, it has set a misfire code for cylinder one. When you check for pending codes, he has pending codes related to lean fuel trims. And what we can see here is we're having to add a lot of fuel. So this starts to paint a picture for us, guys. These codes and this data paints a picture that, hey, maybe this car is running lean. It has a lack of fuel. It's not getting enough fuel, and that's causing it to misfire. That could be this, th all this problem right here 
could be caused by something as simple as a restricted fuel filter. All right, so now you're probably thinking, oh, I wonder when the last time I changed my fuel filter was, right? All right, now you're getting, hopefully you're getting the idea here. So um, again, the value of freeze frame, freeze frame data helps us match or meet the enable criteria. I feel like it's very important for your diagnosis and even more important for you to diagnose your repair. And most of the time, if you just get in there and clear the codes, you lose your freeze frame. I see that happen way too much. Car comes in, it's got a code. The first thing the guy does is blow it out of there. He's like, oh, I got a code for misfire. or I got a code for whatever. Hmm, I wonder what it is. And he just erases it. And what has he done in that process? He's lost all his freeze frame data. He's lost pending codes. He's reset all his monitors. So that is not the practice that I want you guys to do under normal circumstances, okay? I want you to save that stuff so that we have this data. And you'll see what I mean here in just a minute. Okay, moving forward. Um, when I'm looking at scan data, I'm always asking myself, okay, does the scan data that I see does it support the PIDs that I'm looking at? Let me say that again. Does it support the, does the scan data, the PIDs that I'm looking at, does it support the codes that I pull? That's what I meant to say. We'll get it straight yet. Um, so if I got a misfire code, you know, does this data here support a misfire? Or if I have an engine that maybe it's setting codes for fuel trim, does the fuel trim numbers I'm looking at support those codes? So um, the amount of data that you get on your car, especially for newer cars, there's so much data. Quite honestly, it can be a little overwhelming. And so one of the things we started doing uh, through, you know, teaching people how to leverage scanners and and diagnostics is we came up with some uh, data parameters that we felt like were more important than the others as far as establishing a condition, right? If I'm doing a diagnosis, one of the first things I'm trying to do is establish a condition. What does this mean? This means, what well, is the engine running rich or is it running lean? Does it have a lack of power? Does that lack of power feel like a restricted exhaust or maybe a fuel filter, which would go back to a lean issue? Um, does it feel more like an ignition system misfire? So through your test drive and through your review of the codes and the data, you're trying to establish a condition. And from there, you can pick up a direction for your diagnosis. Well, that's all fine and good. What's the big six and the grade eight about then? Well, these are data parameters or PIDs that kind of help us figure out what that condition is. So as far as what's, what's your most important data parameter, um, engine RPM is always going to be very important because engine RPM, what's it going to come off of? It's going to come off your crank position sensor. And I'll tell you this, guys, if the computer doesn't know that the engine is rotating, there's no reason to fire the spark plugs, turn on the fuel injectors. So that's your most important sensor on the whole car is your crankshaft position sensor. That gets relayed to me from engine RPM. So if I have a car that's a no start, and here's a tech tip for tonight. If I got a no start and I hook up my scanner, I start cranking it over and I don't see any RPM come up as I crank it over, I'm going after that crankshaft position sensor and testing that. I'm getting my multimeter out. I'm doing pinpoint testing on that because it's probably the cause of my failure. The computer doesn't know that the engine's turning. Why is he going to start the car? So engine RPM, really important data pit. So there's one of our big six and gray eight. So then we got our coolant temp. That's also an important one. I'm going to put on our short-term and long-term fuel trim, okay? So those let us know what's going on there. And it's kind of like just how it's on the order of this thing. I wanna know 
what the load is on the engine. And I can get that load information either from my map sensor. So I'm gonna get my text tool back up here. MAP sensor or maybe a MAF, mass airflow, whatever my engine has, because cars will usually either have a MAP or a MAF. If they have a MAF, the MAF usually takes priority, but I wanna see that thing because I wanna know about the load going in the engine. So let's start, um, let's start counting these up then. Well, we have one, I'll, ch I'll change the colors here. Go back to the green. We got one, two, we'll go three, four, five, okay? And uh, it's, uh, oh yeah, it is on here. And then six, I wanna see what my O2 sensors are. So why do we have grade eight? Well, because if I have multiple banks of the engine or I got multiple O2 sensors, um, uh, you know, this, this six items get stretched out. So here's seven. And the other thing that's not on here that I really like to see, because again, it helps me figure out the load of the engine is my throttle position sensor, all right, TPS. So I wanna see that throttle position sensor because those things will help me determine like, is the engine hot? Is it cold? Is it running rich? Is it running lean? Um, what's going on with the load of the engine? And then what's the O2 sensor saying? And then what's the computer's response to that? So those things will generally let me know how the car's running and help me kind of figure out a direction as far as establishing condition. Is it rich? Is it lean? That type of thing. Okay. So moving forward. So one of the things you can do is you can set yourself a custom data list. And on every scan tool, it's a little different. On this little scan tool on our Car Scanner Pro app using our ELM interface, if I click this one live data, I can go through there and I can select up to four PIDs on the app that costs, I wanna say like five bucks. On the free, PID, on the free app, I think you can only select two PIDs, but I, I can select a few different PIDs to look at and it will actually then allow me to graph them out. And the advantage of making a custom data list is then you're not overwhelmed with PIDs to look at. You can just look at the items that are important to you. It will also speed up the data refresh rate of all the data because otherwise what happens, and I'll go back a slide on this, otherwise what happens if I got these things, let's say I got 50 different data pins behind me here, is the computer has to say, hey, what's the vehicle speed? What's the engine RPM? What's the coolant temp? And he asks the computer for all these things. And he goes all the way through his list that might be a hundred different items and then he goes back to the first one and starts his count over again. Hey, what's the vehicle speed? What's the engine RPM? So that takes a while for the computer to do that, especially on an older vehicle that's not running a high speed CAN network. It can be pretty dog slow. So by going to a custom data list and only looking at a few items, it can ask those few items very quickly and it will update the data much faster we say that updates the data refresh rate. Okay, so setting a custom data list on this little tool, I would go right there. If I wanted to see my codes, boom, I'm gonna go right there. If I wanna look at freeze frame, there he is. If I wanna look at all the scan data, he's over there. Um, so it's, does this little tool We'll do all the different OBD2 modes and it does it pretty easy, pretty straightforward. And that's again, why I picked this particular app. Also this app works the same, whether you have an Android phone or a, um, or a uh, uh, iPhone. So I wanted something consistent between the, the different platforms. Okay, 
So now we know a little bit about data and we know about type A and type B codes. And now we're presented with, I, I got a car with a problem. I got to figure out what the problem is, right? We need to build ourselves a diagnostic process. Otherwise, what happens oftentimes is we just start replacing stuff at random. Next thing you know, you've changed all kinds of parts that didn't fix your car and you spent money that you need to, didn't need to spend. And that might be on your, okay on your own car because you're like, well, at least I know that sensor is good now. But if it's a customer car, you could get in a lot of hot water because essentially you're spending money that the customer doesn't need to spend, right? Um, and if I was the customer, I'd get pretty upset by that. So in a professional environment, we really want to diagnose what's wrong with the car and just replace the stuff that is actually defective. So to do that and to do it well, we need to build ourselves a diagnostic process. And that's what, um, that's what this slide's all about here. So here's a good generic diagnostic process. I'm gonna teach it to you guys over the course of this class. You guys can take that, modify it a little bit, tweak it, make it your own, but you're probably gonna have these basic things in it. Because if you don't, you're likely to, again, be replacing the wrong parts or really kind of get yourself all spun out without a direction of what to do on the car. So what you want to do first on any problem is verify the customer's complaint. Now, because our class, we're focused in on scanner diagnostics, for us, that's typically going to be, hey, the check engine light's on, right? The mill is on. Now, here's how I kind of want you to think about this. And it's, it's a little weird to think about stuff this way. Let me go back a couple screens. When this light is on, okay, and the customer brings you their car and they're like, I want you, I, I, I want you to diagnose why the light's on. Like, I don't know, the light's on, I'm paying you money to check it out. In a lot of ways, essentially, the computer's your boss at that moment. What you have to figure out is what is the computer upset about? What is causing the light to turn on? Maybe he, it's because we failed the catalyst monitor, right? So again, the dude in the dash is my boss at this point. The computer is my boss and I got to figure out what do I need to do to make the computer happy so he turns off, so that he turns off this light, right? Because you know, the average customer, uh, they don't really care about stuff. I mean, they might not even care if the car's puking bad emissions or I've been amazed at the stuff I'll see people drive. They just care usually, oh, the check engine light's on and I'm due for smog. I guess I got to finally fix it. Um, so anyways, we need to figure out, okay, well, what does the computer need to see to pass the catalyst monitor, Right. Maybe that it just needs to have a good cat on there with a good amount of cerium in the catalyst material or something um, to, um, uh, you know, anyways, I only, I only want to, uh, you know, get the light off here. It, you know, I got to change the catalyst to do that. Or maybe it's something else. So again, when you're, um, when you're diagnosing a car and you're, the problem is checking your lights on, you got to figure out, well, what's the computer upset about, right? And essentially, you know, that's kind of what we're doing when we're uh, checking codes, right? Checking codes is kind of the report card of what's going on with this vehicle. So that's why my second step is first you verify the complaint. Yep, the check engine light's on. All right. Uh, second thing then is I'm going to pull codes. And I say record there. That means... Record those codes. If you're on your cell phone app, do a screen capture. It's super easy, right? But save those codes. Write them down at the very least. Record the codes so you have them for future reference, right? We've talked about freeze frame now. You've seen a little bit about how powerful that is. How was the car being driven when the code was set? That's important. So I'm going to pull that freeze frame data and I'm gonna record that as well. Again, take a screenshot if you're using your cell phone app based tool and save that. If it's a regular scanner, like old school, big scanner, 
take your cell phone and take a picture of this the scanner screen there's nothing wrong with that so record record right pull codes pull freeze frame now now i'm going to start looking at my scan data here i am i'm looking at it and again like i said does it support those codes do the code if the codes say misfire do i see scan data that looks like i have misfires is there misfire counters on that particular model um if i got catalyst efficiency codes i'm going to be looking at my o2 sensors before and after the cat so i start looking at the data to see if it supports the code probably by this point i got to do some research we can't know everything in fact the more stuff i learned the more i realized that wow there was a lot of stuff i didn't know part of the reason i do this job is i like to learn new stuff and this gets me you know kind of forces me to do that so uh review your service information and it might be okay to switch up steps four and five maybe i'm not really confident on my scan data yet i don't know what the different pids are i might start with my service information for that code and then go to my scan data and that's fine so get some service information that's usually going to take me on some type of flow chart to do some pinpoint tests and my pinpoint tests those are the ones where i'm pulling out the big guns i'm pulling out my multimeter i might be pulling out an oscilloscope i'm following a procedure to pinpoint exactly what the problem is once you diagnose the problem and you get the customers okay now i can perform repairs and then ultimately when i'm done before i give that car back to the customer i'm going to go for a test drive i'm going to scan the car again and i'm going to verify that my repairs really did fix the car. And if you do these things on every diagnosis, you're gonna end up with good diags and you're gonna end up with happy customers. It's when you start shortcutting things that you run into, uh, into problems. So we'll see this eight step diagnostic process a few times over and over and over again, because I can't stress enough how, how badly you need a process when you're trying to diagnose problems on a modern vehicle. Now, I'm going to say that term modern vehicle pretty loosely because we're going to do this very first case study on my old Suburban, which, hey, you know, back when I was a technician, I remember when OBD2 came out and, uh, you know, back when I, you know, a 96 vehicle, man, that was a new car. That, that, seemed, that seemed new. Now it's, you know, getting close to 25 years old. So anyways, um, so here we have this. Uh, 96 Suburban, and I wish mine looked that good. Uh, this uh, uh, truck's got the 7.4 liter. So that's the, the Chevy big block, the classic 454. Okay, so that's what you wanted back in the 90s for towing. Uh, way back when, other than Dodge had the Cummins, the diesel engines didn't really come into their own in the pickup trucks until you got into the very late 90s, early 2000s. Um, this particular one has an automatic transmission, it's got air conditioning, and it's got an air injection pump, air injection reactor is what that stands for, and uh, that means it's got a smog pump on there, okay, which was only on the California models, but anyways. Those are all things like if you were hooking up a, scan, a snap on scanner, it would ask you these things. What's the engine size? What are the options? Here's the complaint, though, the mill's on. And guess what? We verified it. Yep. That check engine light, it's on. All right. So let's start moving forward on this thing. We're going to verify the complaint. Yep. Mill's on. There it is. And we're going to pull the codes. So fortunately for us, we have a pretty easy deal. I got a P0135, which means it's a heated oxygen sensor for bank one sensor one. We have a heater control circuit malfunction. Um, and if your app's working right, you can click that little thing. It should throw you on the internet. You can do a little bit more research on it. Again, what's nice is I have a generic code here. The other thing I'll note is this is the very first year of OBD2. So this system's gonna be much more limited than a 2016 model would, right? It's not gonna be as complicated. So we verified the complaint. We pulled our codes and we're gonna look for pending codes. Well, guess what? If we had pending codes, 
we would get an option to see those codes right here and there's nothing there. So I don't have any pending codes. This is it. All right. So now what, I'm, what am I gonna do? Well, now it's time for me to move forward and look at my freeze frame data. So here we go. I pulled the freeze frame. I had to kind of skip this into two different screens so we could you know, see it all on the slide. So what do I got there? Well, uh, this engine was an open loop, which means it wasn't warmed up probably. Yep, it's only at 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not ice cold, but it's definitely not warmed up. It's not 180 degrees, 160 degrees. It's just warming up. It probably has not ran that long. Look at this one for calculated load. 6.3%. That's like nothing. It's like you started it up and it's idling. Okay, that's it. Does the RPM verify that? Yeah, it's running at 1100 RPM. So this thing's sitting here. It's probably in park and it's warming up. Oh, no, it's not sitting there because look at this. It's actually, we must have just put it in drive and just started to go. And we are up to 13 miles an hour, about 20 grams per second. So we do, we have a little bit of load on there. We're just starting to take off from a stop. We're not going that fast. Short-term and long-term fuel trims, not looking real crazy. Um, that's the conditions that this thing needed to set this code. So that's a good one. So when we fix the car, I'm going to drive it the same way. I'm going to make sure that I start the thing up cold. I let it warm up and I kind of drive around the parking lot, so to speak, and uh, recreate these conditions. All right. Um, moving right along then. We looked at the freeze frame. Of course, we, we screen share. We, we saved these screens so we didn't lose that information. Let's start looking at data. So it's talking about the O2 sensor heater. I'm going to look at the oxygen sensors. So what I decided to do here is I put it in graphing mode. I made a custom data list and I looked at my O2 sensors and I compared bank one, which is the driver's side of the motor to bank two, the passenger side of the motor, right? It's a V8 454. And you can see here I'm at 700 RPM. I rev it up to maybe 2000. I let it idle back down and I see, hey, what's going on with the O2 sensors? Well, this, you know, this one's switching back and forth. This one is too. This one looks a little bit like it's switching a little bit more, but I wouldn't say that anything here is super conclusive. I do see a little bit more O2 sensor activity on bank two than bank one. So I would say the oxygen sensor is looking suspect. Now, one of the things you guys probably don't know about oxygen sensors, unless you've been through engine performance class, is that O2 sensors need to be hot in order to work. In fact, they need to be up at 600 degrees. So if I back up here and I go, hey, I got this O2, oh, it's an O2 heater code. What that means is that this oxygen sensor on this truck it's got little heating elements in it, like a little electric heater that you plug into your wall outlet to heat up your bedroom or something. It's got a little electric heater in there to help that O2 sensor get up to 600 degrees quickly. So it could be that the O2 sensor is working, but the little heater in it isn't working that well. And that's why it's switching a little bit less than the other side. So that O2 sensor is looking a little suspect. I'm gonna pull the service information. So when I look at the service information, I, I get to learn how it works. And this is one of the things I really liked about ShopKey or Mitchell On Demand. I'll put M-O-D for Mitchell On Demand, um, is I like the circuit descriptions. It would really tell you how does this thing work? So the vehicle control module. So you got to know the acronyms, but VCM supplies 0.45 volts to the O2 sensor. And he says about one volt when it's rich and 0.1 volt when it's lean. Okay, so it tells me how it works. Then it tells me this, and this is super important because DC, DTC, data trouble code, will set when the conditions are present. 
What is this about? This is your enable criteria right here. Spelled something like that. Enable criteria or EC. This is the conditions I need to drive the car in to get the computer to test for the O2 sensor heater. So if I think back to that freeze frame, um, the voltage, I don't know what the voltage was, but it looked like it was probably pretty good. Less than 27 grams per second. I think we were at 20, so that's good. It's ran longer than two seconds. We were at 86 degrees, it says 90. I don't know what that was, but it must've been less than 90. And then uh, look at this one. Not a big difference between intake air and coolant temp. Um, and then time. So it's looking at a stopwatch. It's looking at a time clock and it looks to see what does it expect to see in an X amount of time. If it doesn't see that O2 sensor being active enough in a certain amount of time, it's gonna set that code. So that, that's really important information. Okay, so now I understand what I'm up against. I understand how it works. So now I go back to my data and I start testing it. And quite honestly, again, uh, it's hard to see it too much of a difference. I do see here that O2 sensor for bank two looks more active than bank one, right? Although on this screen, eh, they look about the same. Well, here's the problem. Now I've been running this engine for 20 minutes. It's already up to temperature. And what did we learn from that, from that service information is I really got to test this thing when the engine's cold. So if I've already ran the car a long time, uh, I, I need to go take a break, get a soft drink, you know, do something else, work on another job. Let this thing cool down and, and look at it then. Or Maybe there's something else I can do. And so I dig a little further in my service information and I get to some pinpoint tests where it says, hey, you know what? There is an O2 heater, heater element in this thing. So if I look at this diagram, right? I'll do this in two different colors. Here is my, here is my sensor, low and high. But what do I have over here? I have power coming in from this fuse, going through that heater element to ground. So, that, so I should have power and a ground right here. So what I could do is I could say, well, it seems suspect. Why don't I test with my multimeter to see if I have power and a ground at the O2 sensor heater terminal. It's a four wire O2. I'll see if on those two terminals, C and D, I have, I have power and a ground. The other thing I could do is I could measure the resistance of the heater itself. So again, this is like I said, with our pinpoint tests, you can kind of uh, begin to see uh, what's going on here. So again, the scanner class works good with the meter class, right? We use these two tools together almost all the time. If you're a diagnostic tech, this is what you're doing every day. So we start testing for stuff and uh, yeah, we have power in a ground. So that's looking good because this, this code then can actually be set with something as simple as a blown fuse, okay? If that fuse was gone, I wouldn't get power to the heater and I would set this code. But we have power there. And so then we come in with our meter set to ohms, measuring at the appropriate terminals and we get a measurement. And this says 235K ohms. So that's thousand ohms. That's a lot of ohms right there, okay? Well, what does the service information uh, save for specifications? Well, let's... Let's look at some stuff here and see if I got it. Oop, I guess I didn't put it in here. Um, it shouldn't be that much. I want to say it's supposed to be like somewhere between maybe 50 or 15 and 50 ohms. And we got, you know, thousands of ohms. 
So what I what I do is I look at that and I say, wow, that, that heater element inside here, that heater element has failed. It has high resistance in the element, so it can't flow enough current through it. It can't heat up then, and that's gonna set this code. So it seems pretty cut and dry that I have to replace this oxygen sensor. So now I've made my diagnosis, I've done my pinpoint tests, I've used my scanner in conjunction with my multimeter. And now once I get approval from the customer, now I can make some repairs. And this is usually where we get, we make our money in the business. And uh, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of a flawed setup because you actually do a lot of work on your diagnosis Sometimes the diagnosis is a lot harder than the repair, right? You might get a flat two hours of time for your diagnosis and spend six hours. Um, but anyways, that's how it works. So this is where we make our money. This is why you see technicians very commonly changing parts that didn't need to be changed because they, they're like, I, I don't want to spend enough time on the diagnosis. I make money. I get paid to change parts and people throw a lot of parts on. It's just kind of the idiosyncrasies of, how this business and our pay scales are set up. But anyways, so now we're gonna make some repairs and I put this uh, picture here so you guys can kind of see inside an oxygen sensor and you can see here's this heater contact in here. And what an O2 sensor does is it's comparing the oxygen flowing past the sensor element that's in the exhaust versus the oxygen that's coming from outside. It's like an O2 comparator, if you will. Um, it needs to be hot in order to do that. And so if I don't have a good heater, yeah, that's going to affect its ability to work. And that's why the computer tests, it, why the computer has a monitor for that. So we got our O2 sensor socket and we we're going to change out that O2 sensor. Now I have some recommendations for you guys. And that is if you're changing an O2 sensor, don't get one where you're having to splice wires and stuff together get one that's a direct fit with like a factory style plug connector to, to put that thing together, okay? And pick good brands. Yeah, you know, like Bosch is a good brand. They invented the oxygen sensor. Um, a, lot of, a lot of cars will use Denso parts on them from the factory. So that wouldn't be a bad choice, right? Um, but use a good quality part. Don't use anything that you're having to splice the wires together. Remember from the the service information, this is a zero to one volt signal. So it would not take very much resistance in that wiring that you splice together to really mess this thing up, okay? So get a direct fit sensor that's of good quality. Okay, so now you've thrown the sensor in the car and now we drive the car around. And what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna verify our repairs. So, We've saved the scan data. We've saved the freeze frame. Now we're gonna clear the codes and we're gonna start driving, okay? And when we drive, we're not just gonna drive it like a maniac speeding around town. We're gonna drive it in such a way that we meet the enable criteria so that we do what, what in the OBD2 world we call a trip. We perform a trip, meaning that it meets enable criteria, the monitor runs and it gives the computer a result. So even if this is a type B code and this would be a type B code, it's not gonna turn on a check engine light right away, but it will set a code. So I can go in there and check for a pending code to see if I've met the enable criteria, I performed a trip, do I have a pending code? Now, here's what you would see for this particular one if I back up. I wanna get my, uh, my scanner screen up here. So let me kind of clear out these drawings. If I go back to this screen and I clicked this guy that says emissions tests, it'll show me all my monitors. And one of, the, uh, one of those monitors is gonna be O2 heater. So I can drive this thing around to meet the enable criteria. What was the enable criteria? The easiest way to figure out what that is, look at the freeze frame data, right? So I drive around just like this. Then I go right here and I see, hey, did it run the O2 heater? Once it says O2 heater complete, then I'm gonna go over here 
and I'm going to check for codes and I'm going to see, do I have any pending codes? So let's go back to where we were. We're on our final test drive. We're verifying our repairs. We have no pending codes. We could possibly look at mode six data. We'll talk more about that in the future because that's two hours in itself of a discussion. Um, but we're going to check for codes and pending codes. If we know about mode six data, we could maybe look at that. But by doing so, we're going to have good assurance that when we give the car back to the customer, it's not going to turn the check engine light back on for that same code, right? And, you know, it might, they, we might give the car back to the customer, they drive it for a month and it turns the check engine light back on for a different code. Hey, guess what? That's not your fault. That's not your problem. That's something else. That's why you save these scanner screenshots. Sometimes you have a code that is set and that prevents other monitors from running. For example, if I'm setting an O2 sensor code, I'm usually not gonna be able to run the catalyst monitor because proper completion of the O2 monitor is a part of the enable criteria for the catalyst monitor on a lot of cars. So anyways, by doing this, what we're trying to do is to make sure that we're not gonna give any surprises to our customer. Because if you give them the car back at a day later, boom, check engine lights back on, they will lose all confidence in your ability to fix that car, right? So if we do this correctly and we verify our repairs and we follow a good sound diagnostic strategy of verify the complaint, pull codes, check for pending codes, freeze frame data, scan data analysis, pinpoint testing with by using your service information, you are gonna have happy customers. I don't know if they're gonna be as happy as that guy, but they'll be happy nonetheless. And that's, that's kind of what we're after. That's what we need to do in this business to be successful. Um, and uh, that's what I'm trying to get across to you guys. So anyways, that Suburban, it was a pretty simple diagnosis. It needed an oxygen sensor and, uh, you know, but verifying stuff. Now you might think, well, how could you possibly screw, screw that up, right? Pretty simple. Well, let me, let me tell you a little story. Very similar, we had like a, you know, and this is back in the 90s. So we had a, let's say a 97 or 98 Chevy Tahoe come in. And it was from a little used car lot. That was a nice high volume lot. They sold nice cars. Comes in, O2 sensor code, just like we had in this example. And uh, my boss looks at it real fast and he throws an O2 sensor in there. Drives it around the block, everything looks good. He clears the codes, drives around the block, gives it back to the car lot. They start taking a, their customers on test drives and guess what? They get that person on that test drive and they're driving along and then boom, check engine light comes on. Why? Well, let's back up this presentation. Remember, if the check engine light came on, there's two types of codes. And there's type A's and type B's. The vast majority of those codes are type B's. So what's a type B require? He requires two times the, in the row to see the failure. So here's what happened. Is it really just needed an oxygen sensor? but my boss changed the one on the wrong side of the car. He changed the O2 sensor on the passenger side, V8 engine. He, he changed the O2 sensor on the passenger side when he needed to change the O2 sensor on the driver's side. He was in a hurry, didn't look at stuff, cleared the codes, drove it around the block. There's our first trip. And guess what? It set a code, but it didn't turn on the check engine light. Why? Because it's a type B code. So now the cust they, you know, the car lot gets the car back. They go on that test drive with that customer who's anxious to buy that pretty new at the time, you know, Chevy Tahoe or whatever. And uh, now the check engine light comes back on because now he's seen his second failure. And unfortunately for us, as we lost that account, that, sh that lot that would send us 
several cars every week for smog, safety inspections, general repairs. We'd fix all their stuff up before they would sell it. They're like, these guys don't know what they're doing. Boom. See you later. All because we didn't do a good enough job. We were in a hurry, right? And the old saying is, there's never time to do it right the first time, but there's always time to do it again, right? Because we later then changed the O2 sensor on the correct side. Now the thing got two brand new oxygen sensors. So we ate the labor, ate the part, and we still lost the account because we didn't do this step right here properly. We didn't go for a test drive, make sure we met the enable criteria, looking at the scan data and checking for pending codes. And so we didn't end up with this guy. We ended up with these guys. So anyways, that's not a mustache. It's supposed to be a frowny face. All right. So that's what I had for you guys tonight. Hopefully that, uh, that made some, uh, made some sense for you. What I'm going to do is change my screen share back to this. I'm going to clean things up a little bit. Um, for us and uh, go back to our course here. Again, so what do we have coming up? We have our first little quiz coming up. We've got a little discussion here. So if I go to discussions, we have a, we have a discussion on um, getting used to normal data and a few folks have already posted stuff on there. So when you look at this, Pick something else. So Matt did a great job talking about intake air temperatures. G talked about um, uh, intake manifold pressure sensors or MAP sensors. I threw a little comment in there today. Um, pick a different sensor. Pick, uh, you know, you could pick an oxygen sensor. You could pick um, throttle position sensor is always a good one. Crankshaft position sensor. Please somebody pick crank, somebody else pick cam. Um, and start punching those things out. So we have all this good information that we can share here. Um, we have our, uh, our quizzes. So I'm gonna go here to assignments because I'm in my student mode. So I can see under student mode, I haven't done any of this stuff, but uh, there was a, what is your protocol? So remember when you hook up your little scanner, a lot of times right here in the center of your scanner screen, it will tell you what the protocol is. Um, so that's a pretty easy one to do. So we'll go back. What else do we got on here? Going to go back to assignments. Um, so we got our little quiz. We got getting used to normal data. And what is your protocol? You could honestly do all three of those things probably within a half hour. Uh, you know, if you're just trying to punch through it, if you kind of took your time, it might take you like an hour. Okay. So it's pretty easy stuff. What I don't want you to do is get way far behind. The other thing I'm interested to have you guys do is this one. What diagnostics do you need? So now that you start scanning your cars, you start pulling data, you start pulling codes, do you have some problems with your cars? We can start using your car to build a case study and that way we can figure out what's wrong with your car and diagnose it together, okay? Um, so that's what I'm hoping that we'll, we'll get a chance to do. So, uh, so now you know what assignments and stuff are coming up and how to, how to get to that stuff. We've talked about all kinds of stuff, but I think I wanna do one, one last thing here. Uh, for us, if I can, there it is, click the right icon. I'm going to uh, change my screen share again, guys. I'm gonna change that one more time to show you my computer desktop. And now what you can see here, if I get this guy out of the way, oh, it's doing all kinds of stuff I didn't want it to do. No, it's not what I want you to do. is we'll get the document camera going. Oh, look at this stuff, messy desktop here. Oop, wrong way. Get the soda can out of the way there. We'll, uh, get this thing going. So let me focus this in a little bit. 
course, remember, we have these two different interfaces for you to check out. This one works good with Android phones. This one works good with iPhones. Um, they're both pretty sweet. You can, you can buy these yourselves for right around 20 bucks. Um, I want to say this one's a little bit more expensive, but pretty economical. And I, I think, you know, yeah, they're not like a super professional tool, but they work good. They have good communication. Like this thing, I've had it communicate really nicely with every car I've tested. It's a good backup. It's a good backup to that $2,000 factory scanner that you might have. Um, so let me turn my phone on here. And you can see I got a screen up here. And uh, this is one that I was scanning the other day. And um, it's a 2007 Saturn. And you can see right here, it tells you what's the OBD2 protocol. It's ISO, blah, blah, blah. It's basically CAN, controller area network, and it's running at 500 uh, kilobit baud. So it's, it's high speed CAN. Here's the other interesting thing, and we'll talk more about this as we go through the other modes of OBD2, is it tells us what the vehicle's VIN number is. And um, right here, and the calibration ID, that's really important. I have diagnosed some cars this way because, uh, you know, I had uh, students that were putting like random computers in their cars and it was the calibration of the computer was way off. So when you got a computer for a V6 in a V8 car, guess what? It's not going to run right, guys. Um, so this is really important stuff. You could check these numbers with your service information and figure out if somebody reflashed the computer. Side note to this, if you're the guy who's doing some tuning of your own, because I was reading through some of your posts and some of you guys are into that stuff, this is how if you go get your car smogged, the smog machine can tell if you reprogram your computer because that will change that calibration ID number. Okay, so anyways, I wanted to show you that screenshot. We'll get more into that mode later in the class, but that's normally where it will show you if um, what your protocol and stuff is. Let me do one last thing. I'm going to open up my car scanner app. Here he is. He's loading. And he's thinking about it. The other thing I like about this little guy is it's got a demo. So I'm going to click demo here as soon as it loads up. Demo. Okay. Okay. And uh, when I'm in that mode, uh, I, can, I can play around with different things. Like I can look at my uh, live data. I usually like to separate them out. I can graph them. All right. So I can say, hey, I want to look at something else. Um, calculated engine load. So... But here's something else I want to point out to you guys. This little star wheel right there, if I click that, I can go to connection profile. I got to get it out of demo mode. Stop demo. If I'm having communication issues, go down here and start to enter stuff in and try to figure out what your communication profile is. And so if it doesn't tell you what your communication protocol is, what you could do is put in your vehicle and it will tell you different things. So it tells me different ones like this one is J1850. So maybe I try all these other ones, CAN bus, CAN bus, they're not working, but it talks with J1850, then that means I get this on the screen. You guys can't see that. I just realized well, that didn't help. So J1850, if it doesn't communicate with any of these other ones, but it communicates on this one, then J1850 is my protocol. If it communicates on that one, then can controller area networks my protocol. So that's, that's another way to figure out what your protocol is if it's not coming up and telling you what your protocol is right here, okay? All right, 
Well, hopefully you guys um, got something out of that. Um, we went through all kinds of stuff uh, tonight. And, um, you know, yes, our little scan tool that we're using for our examples, it's not a professional series tool like you might get from Altel or a snap -on, or one of the tools that snap on sells. But if you can use this little scanner interface and you can do these generic things where pulling codes, data, freeze frame, you understand the difference between type A and type B codes, you will be so much further ahead than the guy that maybe has this Altel scanner for a bunch of money here and doesn't understand any of that stuff and doesn't know how to use it. I know people that have a tool like this and they basically use this thing, you know, as a glorified code reader. Okay. So what I'm trying to get you guys to do is to be power users of your scan tools. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, as we wrap up, does anybody have any uh, last minute uh, questions for me related to scanners or anything like that? I will, um, I will check over on the chat. I'll see if anything's there for us. Let's see chat. No. Okay. So looks good. Well, uh, gentlemen, I'm just trying to clear out a few things. Thank you for, um, thank you for being here, uh, with us tonight and, and hanging out and, um, uh, you know, working through all this stuff. Uh, I appreciate having some um, some company. Again, I hope I hope that you uh, get something. Uh, hope that you get something out of that. And uh, again, I want you guys to pull your um, pull your vehicles and uh, uh, get share with me your codes, your uh, your data, your freeze frames, and we can use your cars in the future for scan data analysis and troubleshoot some of your stuff. Okay. All right. Thanks for hanging out. I'm going to close it down. You guys all have a good night. We'll see you later.